Most of what you're getting taught uh, about how to break into the field is three to four years old, and the field's changed significantly. What used to be focused on to get hired three to four years ago is vastly different than what you have to focus on to advance your career today. So let's cover all of that. First, as you can see, technical skills, not much has changed. If you look at a technical requirement set from a job that was three to four years old versus what's happening right now, all of your cores, your programming languages, your libraries, your packages, the need to know SQL, all of that technical stack and model architecture all of that's mostly the same. There's a couple of things that are worth noting though. Let's talk about JavaScript because it's a it's a big focus because the front end side and the front end capabilities of JavaScript allow you to present your data in probably some of the most interesting formats and most useful formats from a business value perspective. So it's worth mentioning. Git, Google Cloud Platform, you've got your containers, your microservices are becoming very important. They're worth, if you want to do some continuing education, those two areas are great to do like a six week class on. Data structures, your pipelines, your architecture, all of these data engineering concepts and a focus on cleaner data, best practices and best, better gathering. All of those are important to look at and highlight on your resume. And finally, MLOps is gaining traction even within data science roles. But right now, the way that MLOps is defined is very vague. It's a general description that focuses on your capability to maintain and improve, especially continuous improvement for retraining and testing in production. So those are things to look at. And from a technical standpoint, those are worth improving if you don't already have some hands-on experience with it or haven't already taken some classes on them. What has changed a lot are this move towards capability. All of the capabilities that used to get these one-line blurbs and weren't very specific in the past now have detailed, sometimes entire sections. The lines that are asking for capability Abilities are talking about a day in the life, what you will actually be able to do and what results you can drive. So your resume needs to evolve and your profile and the way you present yourself needs to evolve to show you you are capable, not just knowledge of things like Python or TensorFlow or SQL, but capable of and especially with a focus on business values. So that's how you need to present yourself in your resumes and on your profiles. There's four main areas that I'm gonna quickly cover for you. First is business communications. There is a very thorough definition now. Instead of that one line, you'll see multiple lines where companies are very specific in what they expect you to be able to do with your communication skills and what sort of results they want you to be able to communicate and achieve through teamwork and collaboration. Second is software engineering best practices. This was a smaller focus three to four years ago, but right now the drive towards production and business value, actually getting products out the door is enormous. So having a background in processes, patterns, and practices around delivering reliable and maintainable code is it's extraordinarily important. You need to start highlighting these or start learning to transition yourself towards more of a product focused data scientist. The experimental process, unless you've worked in a very mature organization, you have limited, if any, exposure to the experimental process. And we're going to go over exactly what that means. Finally, data management, the rise of the data engineer is reflected in data science roles requiring you to have the ability to gather data with best practices. The better the data, the more reliable the model, the more valuable what you deliver to production will be. That's a huge focus and you need to have that on your resume and in your profile in order to attract the attention of hiring managers in sort of this new climate for data scientists. So I said, we have a formal, well-defined communications. It isn't just this vague thing anymore. So let's hit on the main points. What do businesses want you to do with communications? Well, what you're communicating is become very well-defined because the business is expecting you to make recommendations. They want someone who is an active 
communicator. And that means you're recommending opportunities. You're going out there, you're finding these opportunities, you're identifying business needs, you're talking to customers, and there's a shift from just talking to other technical contributors to being expected to go out, talk to customers both internally and externally, and identify opportunities. You are being, I hate the buzzword proactive, but that's the best way to describe this. You are an active communicator, and part of that is being an active listener. You're able to ask the right questions to elicit business needs, to begin a conversation with users and people on other groups, your stakeholders, people who are talking about the goals that the organization has and that your solution needs to be a part of. So there's this concept of collaborative problem solving. You're working with other groups. You are asking these questions and all of this is building a relationship, creating partnerships. And in the end, the goal is influence. The role of not only a data scientist, but the data science and machine learning organization is growing because the business now depends on this organization and you to deliver significant business value. They're looking at you as a driver of growth. And so you have to have influence. You have to be able to, even in those cases where you're not a leader, you don't have any authority over an external team. You have to use influence and Thought leadership. There are a ton of job descriptions that are now asking for you to be a thought leader in data science solutions and analytical solutions. That's a huge shift. We now have this well-defined framework for business communications and what capabilities you need in order to fit the bill and get hired. So what do you need to highlight on your resume? You want to talk about exactly who you've worked with what other groups and at what level of seniority have you worked with and have you communicated results to? That's everything from what you're used to in visualization and presentations all the way out to team project meetings where you are, again, collaboratively solving problems and eliciting business needs from other groups and then taking those business needs and creating a solution. Were you able to synthesize what you learned from other groups and make tangible progress based on the communications? Talk about your partnerships. What sort of a coalition were you able to build that drove adoption, that created trust in the solutions and the technologies that you're delivering? All of those are exceptionally important to highlight on your resume and talk about thought leadership and mentorship, mentoring other areas of the business, especially non-technical areas, talking about exactly what kind of value you can deliver. All of that's huge. Put it on your resume, put it in your profile, talk about that as a core capability, start getting specific about what you can do with your communication skills. Software engineering best practices are typically covered in a computer science degree, but if you came into the field from another path, maybe from a non-technical field, or if you have a hardcore science and math background, software engineering best practices may not be something that was covered in your coursework. It's worth looking at maybe doing some additional learning, maybe doing a boot camp or taking some additional classes that will help you understand software engineering patterns and practices because what you're expected to build, the software around your model, especially when it comes to implementation, deploying it into production, sometimes working with other software developers, all of that's under the microscope because companies are focused on value. They have finished the prototype phase. They're done with these low returning, sort of unreliable production models. Now they're looking for reliability, maintainability, a delivery cadence, and the ability to integrate quickly at a high level of quality. All of that requires your software development patterns and practices. And it also allows you to work with all those other software development teams to do that, to work, to productize and implement. A lot of times that's going to be the model integrating into an existing product or a brand new product that requires collaboration. Again, back to your communication skills, but this is more of a technical communication and aimed at you transferring knowledge 
to the other group to explain exactly how they're going to implement this in production so that your model doesn't get nerfed. And this is a problem a lot of companies have is the data scientists aren't able to communicate with the software development organization or that larger technical group. And so the model they build and the model that ends up in production are two different things. The core functionality is lost in that integration effort because they aren't able to collaborate with those external organizations. So that's huge. It's another application of not only your software development best practices, but also your ability to communicate and work with other groups using that creative problem solving that we've talked about in the last slide. Now think about scale. Problems of scale sometimes are things you need to address at the very beginning of the project, but they can also creep in in the maintenance phase. As your product stays in production for longer, there's more data that's being ingested. It's continuously being retrained and evaluated. All of that eventually leads to problems of scale. So knowing about scale, scalability, parallelism, those are all important pieces to highlight. If you've worked on projects that have dealt with any sort of scale or scaling, huge. Put it on your resume, put it out on the profile, make sure that's something that you focus on. Finally, there's this concept and there's a lot of language about full life cycle and complete workflow. You are expected to go from what I talked about in the last slide, being able to talk to users, to talk to people in other groups, identifying opportunities and understanding needs all the way through to the end of your project life cycle, where you are deploying, integrating, staging, all of those software development best practices, and then maintaining and supporting your model, continuously improving it, continuously retraining to make sure that your model stays functional and reliable in production. So talk about your experience with Cradle to Grave. Start describing your projects with an eye towards not only that middle portion, but also the very beginning and the end. Focus on the entire workflow to attract the type of attention that's going to get you hired and getting you into a new role. Manage Innovation describes the experimental process, and you may or may not have been exposed to this. So in data science, we do experiments. There's two types of experiments. You have your sort of statistical experiment, where some of the measures and validation mechanisms that you're used to hearing, that's what we use. And we'll compare models against each other and use experiments to prove that we've actually found something, that we've discovered something, our model has learned something. And so that's your phase one experiment. Your phase two is actually more like a science experiment than a statistical experiment. And this is where we start talking about causal inference and causal modeling frameworks. These are being asked for in job requirements. This isn't sort of this two year out long term learning curve. This is happening now. And I'm seeing these more and more desired by hiring managers because this is a capability most companies don't have and they're hiring to build that capability within the organization. So position yourself as someone who understands both phases of experimental design, your research planning phase, if you're not familiar with it, learn about this, learn how research is planned and managed, especially in a business setting, not an academic setting, because in a business setting, you're expected to produce artifacts that provide value across multiple products. This is going to be something that will provide a competitive advantage to the business. And that's what the business is looking for. They don't want import from. So start taking some of the generic projects off of your resume and start talking about where you customized models, where you were able to achieve results and functionality that were not simple, that a competitor would not easily be able to copy. Those are the types of projects that you now want to highlight on your resume. Talk about experimentation, talk about your process and workflow to not only execute, but also manage. You have to design experiments with extreme care, or you end up thinking you've achieved a result and you actually haven't. Talk about that. You've probably dealt with some of these, at least at a high level. So put them in your resume. If you haven't, consider doing more learning and some focused improvement around these areas, especially with an eye towards causal inference and your causal modeling frameworks. 
All of these, not only now, but over the next two to three years are going to be critical for you to land a role in the field. Data engineering is really what we're about to talk about. But data scientists are expected to take a more active role in the data phase of your machine learning workflow. And that means you have to showcase your ability to source and curate. This is huge. A lot of these uh, requirements that I'm seeing have a, a ton of language around you working with finding third party data. And then the curation it used to be called wrangling, but it's a completely different level now. You want to discuss your ability to curate high quality and unique data sets. That's the focus that you want to put and talk about the projects that you've, you've achieved this in. It's more likely than not, you have some work in your history, which has done this. And if you're working to get into the field, spend some time away from the toy canned data sets, because those are actually a negative now on your resume. Having something that you trained on MNIST or any one of those canned data sets, it's bad now. It's not just something that's not impressive. It's in many cases a negative because it shows that you don't have the ability to do the sourcing and curation. So move away from canned data sets and highlight your experience building that unique data set that's a competitive advantage. Talk about how your improvements in data quality, implementing data best practices has led to more reliable models. Again, back to that concept of reliability, even into explainability. That's another huge concept that, it, although it's not being asked for specifically in your job descriptions, it's an important thing for you to highlight because it is going to make you stand out from the rest. Explainability is an upcoming requirement that we're not quite to yet. But if you talk about the data phase, you're going to end up wandering into explainability territory. You can also tie this into your experimentation because a lot of times an experiment results in a unique data set. So tie those two together and make sure that there's a clear connection to innovation, real innovation that leads to a competitive advantage for a company, something that another company is not easily able to duplicate. And finally, what I'm seeing is languages, language around specific data sets. I mean, the exact type of data that the company is working around and working with. So put that in your resume. It used to be you just had this big old skills list. Now think about also having a list of the types of data sets that you have worked with. Maybe some things around what types of data sets you've been able to source and curate with specifics to the type of data that you're working with. It's different, isn't it? Now, finally, I referred to this a little bit in the very beginning, talking about active learning and teaching, being able to mentor, but this time it's being able to be a technical mentor, being able to rapidly learn, apply to build tangible projects, products that will return value to the business, and then to be able to mentor others around you. So now it's not just you as a silo of knowledge, you're able to bring the knowledge that you're learning and acquiring into the organization and make the organization better because of what you're learning. Talk about that. Learn, apply, mentor. Talk about all three areas in your resume, highlight it in your profile because it's important. It's what hiring managers are now looking for and expecting. Self-development is more than just I'm reading. You have to talk about I am continuously identifying new areas within the field that are relevant to my job now. Talk about not only the drive and the curiosity, but also your execution and what the results of you learning are. You can hear so much more of a value focus in aspects of the job description that used to be sort of ephemeral. They were poorly defined and that meant they weren't focused on in the past. Now they're well-defined in these job descriptions. They are requirements. And so you have to be more specific about your abilities to do each and every one of these. And finally, sharing outside of the business, presentations at conference, speaking in any other professional setting, sometimes being a teacher at a boot camp or at a university, guest lecturing, anything that you do outside of the business to be a teacher. And also in a lot of cases, this ties back to being a thought leader. Those are important to highlight on your resume as well. So I've gone through a lot that talks about how a lot of these job requirements that used to be eh, are now capabilities 
that are attached to a day in the life in your role that you are expected to address specifically and describe your particular capabilities and the results that you've driven in the past using those capabilities. 